and uh, introduce myself and uh, and my team. And uh, I've got a little PowerPoint ish, and then some uh, workshop discussion that that we'll get to that hopefully will be helpful for the work that you do. Uh, so I'm Allison Thomas. Um, I am. I've been at AU for quite a while. I came from the literature department. I, I'm still a product of the literature department, uh, and I'm also now the assistant dean of academic integrity, and I run that new office. So we opened in July. We handle all um, academic integrity cases and uh, the work that we um, we've spent time working with Anna and CTRL's team on is outreach to faculty um, to try to have meaningful conversations that support um, faculty teaching. And we've also worked with a lot of support offices on campus um, to make sure that uh, we can provide support in that area also. Um, two, two folks from my team are here today. Um, I wanna give them a minute just to introduce themselves. Alexis, will you say hello? Hello, my name is Alexis. I'm the Academic Integrity Coordinator here in the Office of Academic Integrity. Um, I host the preliminary meetings with our students, so any student that kind of comes into our office and has a case opened, I am the first point of contact. Um, I go through what happened in the case, go over kind of the evidence, and tell them what their options are moving forward. So um, these conversations are great to be a part of because I do talk to the students firsthand, and I get their direct responses and their emotions and all the things. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you all are here. Okay. Thanks, Alexis. Tamara? Hi, I'm Tamara. I am the Administrative Coordinator for Office of Academic Integrity, and I work alongside Allison and Alexis. Um, I contact the students when they've been reported for a case, and I let them know that they will be part of this process to meet with our office and kind of hear their side of things and also to show them available evidence as to why they got reported. And then um, after I set them up with Alexis. Alexis will then meet with them and have that conversation with them. The students will then get a choice um, if they want to proceed with our office or a panel. And then after the resolution is decided, I will get back to them and let them know what the outcome was. So I kind of start and end the process. And um, Alexis, Allison, and our uh, assistant director, Jacqueline, um, kind of play in the middle of all of it. Glad you're all here too. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, so our office spends a lot of time, in addition to adjudicating cases, um, thinking and talking about the issues that are coming up from what we hear from faculty and what we hear from students. And obviously, there's been no shortage of conversation about uh, generative AI tools. So I'm just going to uh, put my little my little robots up on the screen here. Um, I feel like I always go with robots when it comes to uh, uh, presentations about generative AI, but I feel like these robots were a little more old school. They looked like kind of um, like creaky or rusty or sort of like designed 20 or 25 years ago. And I felt like that uh, offered a nice, um, a nice contrast because I think what we discover uh, the more we talk about AI is that um, whether whether you're someone who's excited to use generative AI tools, excited to use them with students, excited to have students use them, terrified, uh, anti-AI, somewhere in the middle. Um, I think what we're saying to faculty and students is that there's still a kind of back to basics for teaching and learning that we can draw upon to kind of move through the, the challenges of these, of these times. Um, so I'll offer you a few bits of insight that we've collected. Most of this is coming from uh, the conversations and reflections that our office uh, has had. So if you saw the session description, um, you saw that uh, this is really stemming from a few things. One is uh, that I mentioned in the description of video that Fox.com published. Um, they do a lot of sort of explainer type uh, journalism. Um, and it's about AI and education. And uh, in that video, our team, we watched it, I don't know, four or five times probably. Uh, and, and we felt like we, were, we heard some of the same comments we'd heard from uh, our faculty, from our students, from uh, folks working in various contexts across campus. Um, so some of the students and some of the teachers that you hear in that video uh, are definitely um, representing uh, sentiments that we've heard. Um, but but there was another part that we focused on that I'll highlight in a second. And that's kind of what led us to thinking about the value of identifying 
the function of a particular tool rather than the name of a particular tool. And that's kind of what brings us here. I'm hoping that we can get some workshop time that allows you to adapt some of the tools we've been talking about so that they can be useful to your own context. And I know some of you are here from the classroom and some of you are here from other contexts. Um, and I hope that, that there's something useful here for everybody. Um, and so if uh, the, please feel free to put um, comments or questions in the chat. Uh, as we go, I'll ask Alexis and Tamara to kind of keep an eye on what's going on there and um, offer links if we have them. Um, the video looks like this. If you haven't watched it yet, I would definitely put it on your on your to do list. Um, like I said, it gives a kind of nice uh, succinct summary of some of the issues that we've been seeing. Um, and I hope it will help like some of the tools that we got from this will help us um, articulate some guidelines um, that we can offer to our students. I do want to note that these slides are actually not, I, I said PowerPoint, but um, it's kind of like becoming the Kleenex of design software. Um, but I used Canva uh, for, for this. And I want you to know that I use Canva's Magic Studio, um, specifically the part of the Magic Studio called the Magic Designer. There's a lot of different um, magic tools um, in, in Canva's uh, suite including Magic Switch, which can create presentations from other formats. I want you to know that I did not use that uh, for this presentation, um, but I did use the Magic Designer, which helps um, uh, to, to offer suggestions for layouts, images, and styles. So if you've used PowerPoint, the designer in that, in that tool is similar. Um, we introduce ourselves to you, but I wanted you to know uh, we've got email addresses, um, academicintegrity at american.edu. Uh, goes to all of us, um, but our specific emails are up on the screen here, and I'll um, make sure this presentation is shared with you in multiple ways, do not worry, um, so you can refer back to it. Um, if you would take a minute and just in the chat, we can do a kind of uh, rushing waterfall or whatever it's called, uh, in the chat, could you type some of the specific generative AI tools that you know? It doesn't have to be something you use or are familiar with, just a tool that you uh, have heard of or that sort of crossed your path. And feel free to include more than one if, it, if it's coming to you. I see chat GPT, I see Grammarly, beautiful AI, Copilot, Click up, Grammarly, Copilot, Dali, Oiter. I don't. I'm not familiar with that one. That's that's interesting. Otter, um, Grammarly Go, Chat PDF, Jasper. Great, thanks. And if you want to keep putting in more as you think of it, um, feel free. Um, Grammarly is the example that I always come back to. Um, but I think when I see the waterfall of, 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 uh, of tools in the chat, um, I don't know about you, but my first thought is, oh, I feel overwhelmed. I feel um, that there's a lot of tools. I don't know all of them. Um, and, and I spend my time doing this. <laughs> like I spend my time thinking about these tools and learning about these tools. Um, it's not the only thing I do, but, um, but I still feel like uh, overwhelmed by the amount of tools that are out there. And actually what makes me feel more overwhelmed is that I feel like I need to know about all of them. I feel like I need to know how they all work so I can get a sense of sort of how they might show up uh, in academic integrity context, but also in questions that come from faculty. And so I feel like that sense of overwhelm, this, this sort of like, how, how on earth am I gonna know everything about all the tools um, is, is came, came uh, to, to a head for me uh, with Grammarly. And so uh, I did a session at Ann Farron uh, and I'll, I'll give you the link to that in a second uh, in January about uh, Grammarly. Um, this is Zach, he's my favorite um, spokesperson for an AI tool. He does a lot of videos on YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, uh, all across the social media verse. Um, he's been helping students crush essays uh, since since 2009, although that's actually not true. I, I think Zach was probably born closer to 2009, <laughs> um, but, but Grammarly has been around since 2009. And it's a tool that uh, many people who, who may have seen it in its early days uh, was a kind of grammar checker 
uh, kind of like spell check. Um, but it's not just a grammar checker anymore. Zach is the new face of AI powered uh, Grammarly, which can do a, a whole uh, basket of things. And um, if you don't, if you didn't know that, and you said to your students, uh, it's cool if you use Grammarly, uh, you, you may not have realized sort of what you signed up for. So um, when I started researching Grammarly and looking at some of its capabilities, that's where this Anne Farron session came from. Uh, this kind of, what if I'm saying it's okay to use a tool, but that tool doesn't actually work the way I thought it did, or it does more than I thought it did. And now I'm sort of authorizing the use of something that I actually sort of don't want to authorize. Um, and this tiny URL uh, here uh, to our, is to our SharePoint site. Um, where all of our presentations kind of live. So if you want to access that presentation, uh, it's also on the CTRL um, compendium of resources there too. Um, and so this question of how we can be aware of all the tools and all the changes, how we can give students meaningful guidance, and information about what tools are okay to use, uh, what tools are not okay to use in any given context, um, re requires that we know all the things and we know all the tools. Um, and that's really impossible. And so this question of sort of how do we um, manage that? How do we navigate that has really been on my mind uh, for a while. Uh, and so while that question was percolating, uh, we, we came across this, this video, the Vox video, AI can do your homework, now what? Um, and one of the areas that we really fixated on, if you remember from the video, is this chart. Um, this is just a screenshot from the video um, and the uh, Joss Fong, who's the creator uh, asks, is it okay? She uses the word chat bot uh, instead of, I'm using generative AI, but we'll sort of call those analogous for now. Um, she asks, is it okay for a chat, to have a chat bot do things like, um, and then she creates these categories, uh, things that involve research, things that involve ideas, things that involve writing, and then further defines those along the tree with more specific uh, parts of the research process or pieces of the ways one generates ideas or parts of the writing process. She gets a little bit more specific. Um, and in the video, we notice that um, the participants, the, the teachers and students kind of weigh in, yes, no, it's okay, it's not okay. Um, and our feeling from seeing the video and talking with faculty and students and uh, folks from across the university is that there really isn't a solid yes or no answer for every context. There's not a one size fits all. Yes, it's always okay for a chat bot to um, offer background information on a topic. Um, we know from our work that it's contextual right? Um, that in some contexts, it is okay to use a chat bot to um, uh, make a study guide for an exam. But in other contexts, it might not be okay to do that. And so that context is really the most important sort of focal point. And so we're thinking about how can we use this chart to help people think about what their context really is? And so I think what this chart invites us to do is sort of identify the pieces of our context that matter the most and then define them in specific terms. And then that kind of allows us to tell students, okay, uh, this isn't about, it. I, I don't wanna tell you students that you can't use chat GPT, but I will tell you for this assignment, it's not appropriate for you to use generative AI or a chat bot to help you revise your text. And so I'm not naming ChatGPT, I'm not naming Grammarly, I'm not naming a specific uh, tool because these tools change and these tools rebrand and they, and, and they come and they go and I can't know all of them, but I can know that this function is not appropriate for this assignment and I can tell my students why. Um, so in thinking about context, identifying categories of functions that tools can perform, and then defining in more specific terms how those functions or capabilities relate to outcomes or objectives in your work with students. If you're in the classroom, that might be learning outcomes. But if you're working with students in other contexts, it might be you know thinking through like, what are the things that I want to achieve here? What are the goals that need to happen uh, in this context that I'm trying to 
that I'm trying to sort of make happen. So if our goal is to help students create a brilliant presentation about generative AI, uh, would tools that generate a script for a presentation be appropriate? Would they meet, would they help students sort of meet the goals we're trying to help them meet? Would they assist? Would they supplement? Would they circumvent or would they obstruct? And so thinking through those questions uh, allows us to be more clear to students, not just about what's okay and what's not, but also why. Um, I think students really benefit from hearing from their guides, their leaders, their instructors, um, the answers not just to what's okay and what's not, but why is it not okay? Or why is it okay? So we kind of defined the, the three main categories that uh, Fong comes up with as sort of broad objectives. So in each of our contexts, these might not these might not be true for you, right? In my context, in teaching a, a class in the writing program, for example, these are actually broad objectives that make sense. But in another context, maybe this these broad objectives are something like um, uh, speaking clear or oral communication or um, uh, artistic or creative expression or uh, graphic design, uh, articulating uh, visually, visual design principles, things like that. And then the specific actions are sort of more detailed things that happen in the realm of that broad objective. So again, for my context, this works, this works pretty well. Um, when I think about what I do with students in terms of research, these are some of the things that I ask them to do. I might put more things on this list. I might get more specific about some of the, um, the things that we, we would do in the context of research. Um, but, but I think the value, there's a, few, there's a few different values here to this chart. I think if you're looking at this chart and you're thinking, yeah, this actually kind of applies to the work I do as is, then I would present it as something you could make your own and you can highlight on it the things that are okay in a given assignment or a given context specific moment, highlight the things that are okay to use AI tools to do or the opposite, highlight things that are not okay to use. Everything highlighted has to be done by a human or everything highlighted, it's okay to use AI for whatever system you think is appropriate. But for some of you, if, if these broad objectives need tweaking, then uh, we, have, we have an idea for you, which is um, we've got a, a PDF and I should be able to put it in the chat. This might take me just a second. And it's a blank PDF, but it's a, a form. So you should be able to use it to, um, should be able to sort of fill it in with your own stuff. And so you can change uh, things around. You can create the objectives that you wanna create. You can, um, you can fill in the different categories of things. I've only given you three boxes to work with, um, but, uh, that should be okay um, for now. And if you feel like you need more, you can always, you can always put more in there. Um, I'm just gonna look around for my PDF here. Got a lot of things open on my screen and I'll put it in the chat. Um, but while I do that, I'll, I'll present to you. So maybe that gets things going for you, sort of uh, wheels turning wise for how you can use this in your context. But I'll give you a couple of options that might help you dig in if you're still feeling like, mm, I don't know if this is useful or not. Um, so take a minute to read through option one, and then I'll show you option two. Okay, so option one is is kind of uh, closest to um, articulating your learning outcomes clearly. So defining your categories and then identifying specific actions. This is kind of like you'd fill out the chart and say, these are all the things I expect to be done by a human student. 
option two is to kind of get closer to thinking about what's okay to be done by by an AI, by a generative AI tool. So defining your categories, broad objectives, the type of work done in your area, then identifying specific actions, performance functions, and capabilities. So that would include things that are human and machine doable in the context you have. So then you can use the chart to sort of highlight uh, if you wanted to. So, so option one is kind of like, you'd be telling students, uh, here are all the things that I expect would be done by a human student. And option two is here are all the things that are going to be done. And now I will identify which ones have to be done by a human versus which ones can be done by a machine. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to put um, the blank document in the chat, here's another description of sort of the difference between number one and number two. And if you want to take a minute and open up the, um, the PDF. to stop sharing the screen for a minute. So you should be able to type right into the PDF, into the different boxes. And what I'd like to do is uh, divide us into some uh, little working groups. So you can talk this through, or you can take a couple minutes to sort of why don't we take a couple of minutes and sort of see what you can do with this chart and then we'll do some breakout groups that um, allow you to kind of talk about what you would do, how you could use this, um, what this might look like uh, in your context. So let's just take a couple of minutes and kind of think through what this what this chart might look like for you and then we'll do some breakout groups. Okay, I'm gonna create the breakout groups and ask us to spend about uh, 10 minutes or so uh, talking through uh, some of the ways these charts are helpful. Um, I can put the um, PDF, I'll put the PDF for this um, presentation in the chat also, so that if you wanna access the um, option one, option two um, bits, you can, you can do that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create those groups and, uh, I think we might be waiting for a few more folks, but I know some people had to leave a little early. So, um, did anyone want to share any of the insights from discussion, from looking at the chart, from thinking through how this approach might, um, kind of help you in your work? Any 
insights. Do you want to go in like um, order of groups, Allison? Um, just looking for sort of high level ideas or reflections. So I don't want to put anybody on the spot or kind of force us to do a, a report out. Um, <laughs> but if there's any, but if there's any insights or even questions or um, or comments that came up in your conversations um, that that we could all benefit from, please share. I can start. Um, our group talked about mostly how, well, not mostly, but like part of our conversation was how trying to find a motivation for students and what they're really using these tools for and in many different areas. Like for instance, we had music and COGOD and like, like the different areas, right? So we all three had different perspectives and we were trying to figure out what is the incentive for students to be using these tools. And that's kind of how we can combat or start conversations with them about it. And so if they're using it for a I had no time, I just needed to complete this and this tool is really helpful for that. We can acknowledge that and be like, that's not super, that's not the point of us being at this university. And like in higher ed, we, you know, cringe at the thought of that <laughs> being the reason students are using the tool. Um, but so if the tool is being used, like we need the support. For instance, I mentioned how I like had used the tool to figure out what an abstract is for my research paper. And that was super helpful to me, but also I could see how seeing what that looks like and what I was supposed to be doing could be like, well, I wasn't ever gonna have those words. I should just pull that from that and just use them as my own. And so I can see that fine line for students. Um, I guess our main point in all this was trying to figure out where we start with our students versus our faculty in these conversations. And so the first thought was just figuring out their motivations and like talking them through it versus just being like, don't do that or do that. And good luck with figuring out how to not do it bad. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Thanks Alexis and Alexis's group. Other thoughts or insights or questions? I'll go. Um, I think that my group member had to hop off after the breakout groups were over. So I'm just going to share for us. Um, so we went with option one. And for the three main objectives, um, we had come up with some some good general ideas. Um, so she had, uh, who I worked with mentioned that she has worked with students in the writing center. So these are where she's getting some of these ideas from. But for the first one, we came up with the general idea of curation of new knowledge. Students should be able to um, obtain new knowledge. And within those subcategories, we, we said things like brainstorming, things like organizing thoughts, and things like addressing counter arguments. Um, and then for the second main idea, we wrote evaluating sources. Um, so that could include smaller ideas of being able to locate academic journals properly um, and being able to identify author credibility, like their level of expertise in the text you're reading. And then for the last one, we wrote the general idea of engaging with others, such as like citations. So being able to identify citations, being able to apply in-text citations and differentiating between MLA, Chicago, APA, things like that. So I, I think we had a, a great conversation being able to dissect like those three things that students should be able to accomplish on their own without relying on AI. That's great. That's really helpful and interesting to think about how um, when we start really getting down to the details, um, sometimes thinking about what AI can do that we know AI can do um, forces us into articulating in even more detail what we want human students to do. Um, that's really great. Thanks, Tamara. Anyone else? Questions or comments? Um, could I add one? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I talked a while about this, but um, I think critical thinking is a big part of what you want out of students. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when, you know, they have to hand in an essay or a project, um, they might think it's easier just to, you know, ask a, you know, chat box or any AI um, software to do that for them. And it, they can't. You know, it's it's we want them to learn. We want them to learn how to uh, think critically, how to relate concepts, how to apply concepts to specific problems. And so when faced to that, that is something where you don't want them using those tools, thinking that the tool is going to substitute that process. 
because that's what we want them to do in the learning process. That's a great way of putting it. Um, and I think helping students see that like what you're doing here is the substitution for actual work that's going to help you achieve a goal is important for those students who I, we see in our office, we see a lot of students who, um, who are saying things like, I thought I was just getting help when I used this tool. Uh, and, and we're saying, maybe we have different definitions of what help looks like. I think this discussion of help and help and what help is is on the is, is we're in the middle of it now, but it's it's ahead of us as well. It's a complicated conversation. I think it includes um, all of the ways we define and articulate help for students. Um, and so I really appreciate um, that point, Laura. I think also um, thinking about these objectives also helps us. Um, maybe rethink some of our assignments. Um, so when we're thinking about my goal is, is critical thinking, the ways that I kind of um, help students to get there now are, might be different than, uh, than an assignment I write with sort of AI's capabilities in mind, right? And so um, a lot of folks are using assignments that test students' critical thinking abilities in other ways. Um, oral presentations, conversations, discussions, um, uh, other ways um, that, that allow them to interact with material and, um, and engage with material. Um, that's not always the answer in every context, right? And it certainly can present other um, accessibility issues um, depending on a student's situation. So I think being mindful of that is also important. Any other questions or comments? Well, um, another thing we talked about was, was um, we talked about an example of using AI to summarize a text, right? And whether that is okay or not. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up discussing about, and a lot of this has to do about how honest the person is. And what is the purpose of using that AI? Because again, if I'm just going to use the software to avoid reading the text, that's, you know, that's not helpful. That's not part of the learning process. If you use it to maybe contrast what you thought were the, you know, the main ideas of the text to see what was relevant or not, and you reflect on that. Same thing with Grammarly. We talked about this as well. So you use a text and you just put it on and hand it in, that's not worth, right? But if you use it and then you contrast and you pay attention to what is the mistakes that you usually do when you're writing, so you can learn about that. Um, but so it, a lot of it has to do about how you relate to the, to the program. So is it something that is helping you grow or is just something that you're using to cut corners and avoid learning? Yeah, that's a great point, sort of how you interact with it and who's who, sort of whose agency or whose choices are kind of represented in whatever uh, gets distributed, I'll say, or, or presented. Um, yeah, in our, in our group, I think we also talked about, um, or I mentioned that uh, um, students need help figuring out what, what an output is. <laughs> Um, right, some students like sort of know about the sort of hallucinations that AI tools can produce, or that um, there can be fake sources or incorrect information. Um, many students don't. Um, a lot of students kind of are, are not super deeply engaged in in uh, thinking about these tools. Um, but when one is presented as a useful thing, um, some some students are interested in trying it. Uh, and it seems like if, you know, if you don't know about the material or you don't have the skills to make a decision about whether this is useful or not, or whether this is credible or not, um, you may be more likely to accept it. And um, that's often the context that we see students um, when they've sort of accepted outputs uh, to substitute for their, for their own work. Um, thanks. Um, well, I appreciate everyone taking the time. If there's other questions or comments, happy to, um, to hang out. Um, the slides will be, I'll put them up on the SharePoint. I'll, let me um, get the SharePoint link in the chat um, just so everyone has it. This is a, um, many of you have probably seen this before, uh, but just in case.
Um, our SharePoint site is a work in progress, um, but it, it's ours, so we can edit it fairly quickly. So if there are tools or uh, things that you'd like to see in this space, just send us an email, uh, let us know. We can put things up there relatively quickly. Um, presentations we've done and uh, uh, resources that we have are, are up there. Um, and I'll post today's um, slides up there also. And then Lindsay put in the chat also um, uh, an evaluation. So if you could take a minute to fill that out, um, that would be also appreciated. Thank you so, so much for your time. Um, I know it's, a, it's never not a busy time, <laughs> um, but I really appreciate uh, everyone that came and um, and shared uh, today and feel free to get in touch with us with any other questions. Academic integrity at america.edu. Um, I'm A. Thomas and uh, you can you can always uh, find me there. So thanks so much and nice to see you all. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Allison. All right. Bye. Bye.